An old regime NDE from 1966, when he was a fighter pilot imprisoned. This is an intriguing tale that is alike most Western NDEs. One is Fahad al Sadun, my father's name. In the Iraqi army, he was the colonel pilot. He resigned in 1974 because he was no longer a member of the Al Bahath party. Two. To my knowledge, I haven't heard of such incidents in Iraq. We sometimes hear rumors, but not the whole story. As you are aware, such stories are not tolerated by society or the regime. When I was with my father at the al Orfali conference in 2002, several people tried to make jokes, and just a few of those in attendance believed the story. 3. My father's near-death experience occurred in 1966 but he first spoke about it in public in 2002 at the al Orfali Conference Hall in al Nasur, Baghdad, Iraq. 4. His story was published in the media in 2005. He was interviewed by Baghdad Iraqi TV satellite channel. Dr. al Gharashi, a well-known Iraqi psychologist, was approached to comment on the near-death experience by the station. Dr. al Gharashi agreed and stated that similar events have occurred since the Age of Grace. All of this is captured in a media video. Colonel Fahad, an officer political detainee, wrote about his near-death experience while in detention. I was held in the Ministry of Defense's military police cell. It was a fairly small room with only a bed and a pit for a lavatory. There was a small opening. I was assigned two guards one of whom resided in a little remote village and was usually on duty. He gradually came to sympathize with me. I used to have him deliver my meals from a neighboring restaurant. A light tranquilizer known as Antibar was available. I requested that the guardsman bring me a packet of these tablets, which he did. So I kept asking him to deliver the tablets until I got roughly 300 of them. I'd like to bring to attention what happened later, which I couldn't explain until now and was beyond my comprehension as a human being. I'm only reporting what happened without comment. I began taking the tablets one day, emptying the packets one by one and eating their contents. There were around 300 pills. I began to feel dizzy and sick to my stomach and my vision became distorted. I gazed at the cell door and the veins in my arm. They were turning a dark blue color. I tried to lie down on my bed after realizing this, but I lost my equilibrium and fell to the floor. I went unconscious. When I returned, I noticed my body on the floor and stood up. My body was still on the floor, much to my amazement. I was standing by it in my new body. My attempt to comprehend what had occurred came to an end as I felt myself ascending higher, leaving my body on the floor. When I got to the cell's ceiling, I tried to lengthen my arm to avoid hitting the fan, but nothing occurred. The fan continued to spin. My body continued to ascend, past the ceiling, and was climbing vertically up in the sky. Looking down, I noticed the buildings of the Ministry of Defense. Then I flew past the clouds above Baghdad and emerged into the clear blue sky. I was startled to see two men dressed in bright white robes. One of the men was taller than the other. When one of the men raised his hand, I came to a halt. The man mentioned for me to approach him closer. I advanced towards the thing without thinking until he signaled me to stop with his hand. I wasn't scared or upset. I didn't feel cold or hot. Instead, I felt peaceful. Why did you do what you did? One of the men questioned. Don't you see that terminating your life is not your right? I'm deeply sorry, I said. I was exhausted and couldn't bear it any longer in my lonely captivity. I tried to figure out who they were as I was answering, but I couldn't. The same individual stated, We are now satisfied with you. We will forgive you for your actions and return you to earth. Do not repeat what you did. Look, do you know any of these? He continued. I realized he wanted me to turn around to see, so I did. I noticed 11 males standing nearby with their backs to me. I don't know any of them because I don't see their faces, I explained. 
Three heads turned to face me after the man signaled. President Abdul Salam Aref was standing next to his bodyguard, Abdullah Majid, and the third was Abdul Latif Al Daraji. You were meant to be with them, but we pardoned you, said the man. We are now transporting you to your home planet, Earth. These eleven will depart your globe and arrive with us in two days. He motioned with his hands once more, and the three heads turned. Do you know why we've forgiven you? He questioned. No, I said. Look towards the earth, he murmured. A MiG-17 jet fighter was flying low in the Barzan district, going towards the rocks and the road where the Kurdish militants were hiding. The insurgents were forcibly gathering women and children and frightening them with their firearms to keep them near. The ladies and children screamed in terror as the MiG fighter soared low above them. Mothers were embracing their newborns, while fearful children tried to hide under women's garments. It was a terrifying scene of death terror. The MiG flew above them without firing a single shot. When the plane returned, I realized it was my plane. I was the one who defied orders to attack. We want you to see with your own eyes the humane deed you did, the man stated. Do not panic. The plane flew over them again without attacking and returned to its base in Kirkuk. I noticed the expressions of the women's and children's faces as they wondered what had happened, as well as the expressions on the rebels' faces. This is the deed for which we have forgiven you, the man added. You'll be transported to the physical world. That was a wonderful act of humanity. Now, before you return, do you have any questions before you're sent back? I responded, yes, I do have some questions. What does time mean to you? Is it a scientist such as Einstein claim, where we have no time like you have? He said, what age are you? 30 years, I replied. Again, look down, he urged. I witnessed my mother putting her newborn baby, me, to bed while an Indian doctor stood nearby. On March 13, 1934, all of this happened in Basra City. Then I saw the entirety of my life flash before my eyes. You just watched your own life in less than a fraction of a second, which for you was 30 years, he explained. Do you have any more questions? Will there be war between us and the Jews? And what will be the outcome? I inquired. Yes, it'll happen soon and you will lose, he said. He motioned with his finger for me to look. I watched Israeli planes take off from their bases and fly low over the Sinai Desert and the Suez Canal. Then they bombed the Egyptian bases, killing the planes on the ground. It was the conflict of 1967. Why don't you help us escape such a disaster? I exclaimed, alarmed. No, he said, because you were a great nation that was fragmented. You were people killing each other in 90 separate places with no unified language. They banded together and united against you. They had one goal and they achieved it. If you want our cooperation, you must first unite your country and return to your former glory. Come together under God and pray to Him as much as you can. Can I tell my parents about what I saw so they can be cautious? I said. Yes, he said. But no one will believe you because you just glimpsed a little portion of the future and are now living in the past. They'll be unable to fathom the future. You and your people are stuck in the past and have no idea what the future holds. After that, he said something. I couldn't completely grasp or comprehend what that meant. We witnessed the creation of your universe from the beginning. Then we witnessed this altar. And then we saw it come to an end. You are now living in a bygone area. We watched these periods come and go. That's why they won't trust you. Now we take you back to the past world, he added. Why don't you do your prayers, he questioned before raising his hand. I couldn't respond and kept mute. I began my drop towards the earth after he raised his hand. Then I saw Baghdad as I flew over the sky. 
I recognized the buildings of the Ministry of Defense as well as the cell in which I was arrested. I had no fear when I reached the top of the building and passed through the roof into my cell. I saw my body on the floor and became one with it. I started screaming in anguish and vomited blood. The guardsmen raced inside the cell after hearing my screams and attempted to inform me that I had fallen from it. They called their commander, Colonel Baggett Said, with whom I had a very good relationship, as soon as they saw the blood I vomited and that I was shaking like a leaf. He wanted to help but was afraid of the intelligence agency and, in particular, Major Abdul Razak Al Naive, the assistant chief of intelligence. Later, I was transported to a military hospital and admitted to the mental and nerve disease wing to rest. I'm not sure how long I was there. The doctor who was treating me came in one day and told me that I had been unconscious for days and was finally recovering. One day, a man arrived with a cat and identified himself as Abu Layla, saying he had been asked to watch after me. He informed me that he would stay outside near the guards because I was a captive. My friend Dr. Nazar al Nab came to see me from the Air Force Hospital a few days later. We talked about numerous topics before I told him about my experience. I told him about the 11 individuals I observed with President Aref. He couldn't believe what I told him. He assumed I was hallucinating. Then he stepped up and added, Don't talk about it with anyone or they'll believe you're hallucinating. Illusions and hallucinations, he muttered as he exited the room. Abu Layla came in to talk to me on my third day at the hospital. I'm quite careful about befriending the talking beings, or humans, he remarked. He stated that he preferred animal companionship. Then he told me about a helicopter disaster in which President Aref and his entourage were slain. I was perplexed by the news recalling the man in a white robe who assured me that no one would accept what I had witnessed. Dr. Nazar came in to visit me the day after the helicopter crash. While he was with me, Abu Layla walked in bearing my breakfast plate, followed by his cat. Dr. Nazar inquired as to who he was and why he was caring for me while I was still a detainee. I don't know, I replied. At first I thought he was from the security service, then a civilian hospital employee assigned to assist me. Please tell me truthfully and in detail what you told me two days ago, Dr. Nazar asked. I'd like to hear every detail. If you plan to harm me, I have suffered more than enough of that in torture and abuse, I told him. You were disturbed, upset, and thought I was hallucinating and having illusions during our prior meeting. What are you going to charge me with now? Conspiring? I won't tell you what I already told you. I cannot stand incarceration, torture, or any other form of retribution. He began swearing that he had come with good intentions, asking, Please tell me again what you told me before. As I already stated, I will never repeat what I previously stated, and that is final. Perhaps I was imagining things. He walked away, still mute. Now that I had fully recovered, the jail authorities asked that I be restored to my cell. Orders were issued to that effect. I went to thank Abu Layla and say him farewell before leaving the hospital. He and his cat were sitting by a fountain. I bid him farewell and informed him that I would pay him a visit once I was released from prison. You'll be released shortly, but you will not find us, he responded, pointing to his cat. After many people intervened and petitioned with the president, I was released from prison in August 1966. I drove a taxi to the military hospital to see Abu Layla, my loyal friend, but he was not there. I inquired about him throughout the hospital. They claimed to know nothing about him or his whereabouts. They claimed he was dispatched by the security service to look after me. That good man was never seen by me again. Thank you.